What you're about to watch is part of a larger video. If you're interested in watching the entire video, check out the link in the description below. I want to dig into it a little bit more because I want to dig into how we got here where so many people have either declared, you know, social justice good or bad, or that we should be attached to this political party or this worldview, and really dig into that a bit. And I want to start with one of the books that I think that, well, I don't think, I, I did not think John Harris's book was going to be as good as it was in really laying out the foundation for how we can see what's happening now and connecting it to what happened um, back in the 70s. So if you haven't watched that overview, let me give you a brief uh, idea. The first six or seven chapters, John Harris kind of lays out the foundations for those that were social justice activists within the early to mid 70s. And those social justice activists in the early to mid 70s were very interesting in regards to all of their backgrounds, basically had three things, three or four things that um, were similar amongst all of them, but none of them met till later. The, the three or four things that were very similar were most, if not all of them, came from fundamentalist Christian backgrounds in which they, uh, the things that the fundamentalist church preached about and taught about, they disagreed with, they didn't like, they weren't sure about. And then the civil rights uh, movement was happening. And a lot of these people that were social justice activists in the early 70s and mid 70s, did when they were growing up and even in the 70s, uh, but especially the 60s, and they... They, they were very taken aback by the way that the church either interacted with the social rights or civil rights movement or just ignored it altogether or stood up against it. And it really left this bad taste in their mouth. So those two things already, just what the church already preached and taught against, plus the reaction to civil rights was, was enough to kind of, you know, put them on edge. The one thing that seemed to really bring them all together, the kind of the, the push that kind of pushed them out of the church was the, the war in Vietnam. Uh, as John Harris kind of outlays in his book, all of these individuals really bonded over the fact that the church responded uh, to the war in Vietnam as a support of uh, the United States doing it. And they, they all were against the war. And this kind of this, this shared hatred for the war brought them together. This, this uncertainty of why the church reacted the way it did to the civil rights movement brought them together. And just altogether, the baseline of what the fundamentalist church that they grew up in taught brought them together as well. Now, the very interesting thing to me in all of this was as I was reading through this, I, I could not help but see the comparisons to the civil, uh, I'm sorry, the social justice activists of the 1970s and what's happening now in social justice and the church as well. I think it's important to note that the social act justice activists that were that John mentions in his book, the early 70s and mid 70s, are people that are primarily, with with a couple exceptions, still alive today. So they're still having an impact and a hold uh, within Christianity today, even because even though they had left the church, many of them came back. Uh, and they had what we would consider deconstructed their faith. So they had taken things off of it and then added things to it. But two of them were professors of, or not professors, presidents of uh, seminaries. Uh, a few of them went into nonprofits as far as economics and, and civil rights. But what we see comparison-wise to the social justice activists of the 70s and now is much of what's happening within the progressive Christian church, uh, the deconstruction movement, uh, the ex-evangelical, kind of that title. Uh, obviously, all three of those are distinct, though they have some kind of, uh, you know, play over depending on who you talk to. But the similarities with the social activists of the 70s and now is just, it, it, it's mind-blowing. Like, I cannot get over how similar it is. So, for the social activists of the 70s, they were very uneasy about what the church talked about how the church uh, spoke about the Bible, how they said it was God's word, how they took it uh, to be what it said. It, you know, to, For example, Jonah and the well, that's a real story. Jesus' resurrection, that's true. Um, the virgin birth, they held to that. And the early social justice activists, just, they didn't like that. So they came out of fundamentalism. And what we see now with a lot of the categories that I mentioned before, the progressive Christian church, ex-evangelicals, right? A lot of them came out of the conservative Christian movement, which is distinctively different from fundamentalism, but there's enough similarities. And they, they, they have the same issues with the conservative Christian church as far as its view on the Bible. It's preaching about resurrection, virgin birth. 
uh, some of its views on the atonement. And so they were already uneasy about that. But starting about 2013, 14, 15, a lot of people uh, that, that were already uneasy um, really became even more uneasy as I, when the church started reacting in, in a way to the Black Lives Matter uh, organization. Uh, much like the social justice activists of the 70s were very uneasy about the civil rights movement and how the church reacted then. And then came this kind of generation's Vietnam in regards to the election of Donald Trump in 2016. This seems to be, to me, as far as I'm just looking at the landscape here and comparative wise, this seems to be sort of this generation's Vietnam in the sense that what really bonded the social activists together in the 70s being Vietnam was really what bonded the progressive Christians, the deconstructionists, the ex-evangelicals, what really kind of bonded them together, get, it started kind of uh, the momentum to go outside of the church was the final straw seemed to be Donald Trump's election in 2016 or the subsequent campaign that happened in 2020. Uh, within those four to six years, right, that there's a lot of this brewing. And then 2020 happened. Uh, 2020 uh, was an interesting year for a lot of different reasons, obviously. Uh, Black Lives Matter uh, really came into more prominence with uh, George Floyd and that everything that happened there. And then, of course, we had, you know, where everybody just didn't have to go to church anymore because there was a shutdown. And that gave... Uh, a lot of people that were already kind of teetering on the edge, an opportunity to say, I'm just not going back anymore. So the similarities here are, are, are amazing. Now, there's two things I haven't mentioned, uh, or one thing primarily, I suppose, that I haven't mentioned that is different between the social activists of the 70s and now. And that is word of mouth. So Harris notes in his book, that in the 70s, uh, early to mid, those social activists, uh, social justice activists, basically were they, were, they were kind of barred in by the fact that they did not believe that radio and television were the means that they wanted to use in order to get their message out because those things were connected to uh, the man, the government, and they didn't trust that. And the conservative Christians at the time did. And so because conservative Christians like uh, Pat Rod Robertson, for example, the 700 Club, like they, they dove all into that market. So everybody got to know them and the social justice movement sort of voice was drowned out with all of the conservative Christian um, things that happened, TBN, all of those that really just took over. Now, the, the, flip is, uh, the script has kind of flipped now in the sense that um, those in the progressive Christian movement, the ex-evangelical, the uh, deconstruction movement have really embraced social media. They don't even need TV and radio. Forget that nonsense. They have podcasts and, and TikTok and YouTube and Instagram, and they do it really well, like really well. And so the difference here is that now the, the, the voice that was in the 70s is amplified now in, in very similar ways, very similar motives uh, for, for kind of what's driving this side of social justice, only now that the voice is amplified because you don't need television and radio anymore. You have access to everyone all at once. All you have to do is word of mouth. A share will grow a platform um, in a moment. You just watched a clip from a much larger video. If you like the content in this clip, make sure you check out the link in the description for the full video below.